and valvular disease. Um, so I thought we'd just try and keep it to kind of case-based to really think about what's the murmur going to sound like, what's the diagnostic findings going to be, and we can um, get go, like kind of refer back to our physiology and stuff to determine heart failure. Are Alex and Josh texting each other? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of you looks down and laughs, and then the other one looks down and laughs. I'll, I can, I'll tell you what it's about if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. realised that I hadn't washed the conditioner out of my hair. I just go. Oh, <laughs> spiky. And I'm like, why does it feel so like greasy? I've got conditioner in my hair. And then I looked up, and it made me laugh. Anyway, I just thought I'd let Alex in that secret, but now everyone knows. All right. <laughs> Excellent. I'm really glad that we started recording before that came out. <laughs> um, Sorry. Sorry to be so, real. <laughs> it's good. I did ask the question. Um, yeah, so I thought we'd just keep it really case-based to sort of work through like what we'd expect on radiographs, what we'd expect on echo and stuff like that with a couple of the different diseases. Um, so let's say first you're presented with a four-month-old Sheltie who is clinically very well, according to the owner. Uh, it's presented for a 16-week um, vaccination. And you hear a murmur, which is loudest during systole, but you think you might be able to hear a diastolic component to it. Firstly, how do we classify murmurs? Like, what should we be noting when we're documenting a murmur in a, in a patient? Location. Mm -hmm. What are the options? Um, like the different valves, I guess. So left sided, mm -hmm. right sided, but then whereabouts you can hear it on those sides. Um, Good. Whether it's more mitral aortic pulmonary and then yeah. right parasternal um, tricuspid. Yep. And then the, there's a certain murmur is, is sort of craniodorsal to the aortic area. Mm -hmm. Which one is that? Right up under the... Uh, yeah, now there's a good question. <laughs> it's good to know it's very distinctive. It's also good to know what it means. <laughs> perhaps, I don't know which uh, one perhaps the two Alexes could uh, answer that, or, or maybe Max. Oh, I'm out. She forgot to change the name. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, um, like a basil... Uh, no, mind, is that what we're talking about? I'm guessing a PTA. Yeah, that's what I understood it to be, yes. Yeah. Um, in reality, I, I think with humans, it's much easier to map out which valve is the origin of the murmur because you kind of, the heart sits like the right-sided murmurs are right parasternal, the left-sided murmurs are left parasternal, and uh, they're, they're really kind of bigger and clearly demarcated. Whereas practically in dogs, because their heart varies in position, their chest shaped vary and things like that, I think it's really hard to isolate which valve it is. And in fact, during the week this week, I was like, this is a really classic basal murmur. And literally said that to someone and then did an echo. I was like, it's an apical murmur. Definitely should have said apical. <laughs> so I usually define them as basal or apical. And then, like Alex said, which side they're audible on. And then whether they radiate as well. So where would you listen for radiation? So a left-sided murmur might be audible. Where else? Well, the most common ones, audible all over the left side and also a bit on the right. Yep, absolutely. What about a murmur of... Actually, we'll do a case on that one, so we won't go too much into that one. So this dog has... Let's say a um, continuous murmur, which is louder during systole but is still present during diastole, and it's present in the basilar heart at the heart base, loudest at the heart base on the left. What further diagnostics are you going to recommend for this patient? Okay. 
Excellent. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Blood pressure. Oh, good. Yeah. Absolutely. Thoracic radiographs. Good. Excellent. <clears throat> A nickel exam is also important. It'd be interesting to look for um, uh, aortic, um, listen for aortic murmurs, uh, look at the jugular, Good. refill and, and collapse uh, and any jugular pulses. Probably this one, I don't think I'd see any of those though. Mm. Um, really good point, Jeff. When you say aortic murmurs, what do you mean? Well, there's a certain murmur can be heard in the neck. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. It's not a order up there, is it? That's right. It's my aging brain. Um, it's the carotid. It's a carotid murmur, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, but you're kind of right. And I was going to sort of make a case of this, but the other point of radiation. So radiate left murmurs can radiate to the right hand side but they can also radiate cranially. And if a murmur is audible at the thoracic inlet, where would you localise it to? A aortic, I think. Yeah, Jeff Jeff usually. Yeah. usually. Um, because dogs' chests are different shapes and things, then obviously radiation can change a little bit. But the vast majority of murmurs that are audible at the thoracic inlet are aortic in nature um so it's a really good one just add that to the list of places where you put your stethoscope do they radiate uh, elsewhere or are you likely to miss it if you don't auscultate there you can hear it loudest over the left uh, left base uh, heart base so up in the left axilla um but the difference is you know you can have a mitral regurge mm. there um you can have so sort of a, most audible there whereas none of the others radiate to the thoracic inlet. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, so we do chest radiographs and you see on the VD a bulge in the root of the aorta and the heart just looks a little bit big, but because it's a puppy, it's hard to judge. Um, then you get Rita to do an echo because I don't want to. <laughs> I don't like doing young dogs. I just find there's so many different abnormalities it could be. And a lot of congenital heart diseases come with other congenital heart diseases. So dogs with pulmonic stenosis might have concurrent, uh, like VSD or something like that. Um, so I would much prefer that these are done by a cardiologist, but interested to have a look. Um, so we see a PDA on the echo. What causes PDAs? So, um, <clears throat> it's like a, a, it's a shunt that's normally there in utero that doesn't like ligate, self ligate and um, mm -hmm. turn into that kind of remnant, that li like ligamentous remnant, but mm -hmm. um, remains open. So it shunts, I think from aorta to like I think one of the pulmonary veins or somewhere around there. I don't know, it kind of shuts. Like, I can't remember. Something like that. Yeah. Matt, you want to take that? Yeah, take that one. <laughs> uh, I think something from aorta to pulmonary artery. Good. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Gosh. Yeah. So the pulmonary vein would just dump straight back into the left hand side of the heart. Whereas in PDA, right, yeah. yeah the pulmonary artery is oversupplied with blood. So the blood from the left side of the heart goes from the aorta into the pulmonary artery and overcirculates the lungs as well. So what other changes do we want to look at on our radiographs now that we know there's a PDA? Pulmonary vasculature. Yes, excellent. Yeah, so you can often see quite a, a vascular pattern and over-circulation, so both the pulmonary arteries and veins are going to contain more blood than usual. Um, on echo, over, so say this dog was not four months old, say it was two years old, and this is the first time you've heard the murmur, 
what other changes might the heart have like now that you know what happens when heart failure develops and the physiology of it what else might you expect right right sided cardiomegaly yeah maybe yeah it's interesting it's actually not often not that profound so because the blood never actually gets to the right heart the right side often looks quite normal. You'd expect it to be working harder to push that blood through the pulmonary vasculature, mm-hmm. but actually that force comes from the left-hand side. Um, what about pulmonary hypertension? Would you expect yeah. signs of that? Absolutely could do, yeah. Um, what would dictate the development of pulmonary hypertension? I don't know. <laughs> For a reverse shunt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so pulmonary hypertension is just more, more pressure in the pulmonary vasculature. And if you've got uh, open and during systole, you've got communication between the left side of the heart or the aorta, which gets up to 120 millimetres of mercury, you've got that communicating directly with the right side. So what adaptive things are going to happen in the pulmonary arteries to be able to cope with that increase in pressure? Thickening. Yes, good, yeah. Um, so we get thickening of all the layers. If you remember the endothelial, I oh, you know what I did. I might have a picture I can share with you, but let me just check. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay, amazing. So normal blood vessel, we've got the external elastica, internal elastica, so those kind of um, uh, like layers that stick everything together, but we've got adventitia, media, and intima. The intima being the endothelial cells, media being smooth muscle cells, and then the adventitia being the kind of the stuff that holds it all together. So as pulmonary hypertension develops under the effect of kind of increased shear stress, so more blood flow flowing faster through those vessels, the vessels are actually going to get thicker, but it's very, you can see that the, the vessel now ends up thinner. So the walls get thicker, but the actual lumen gets thinner. So we get a thickening, particularly of those muscular layers to hold it up, to try and kind of maintain flow and stop the vessels from blowing, ballooning out. Then we get uh, fibroblast proliferation and thickening of that um, adventitial layer as well, as well as increased inflammatory responses, so lymphoid follicular generation. So these two are reversible. And then once we get to this point where there's completely disordered um, uh, fibroblast activity and angiogenesis, and we end up getting multiple small arteries essentially within the main artery, and a loss of that muscle wall. This is called plex, plexiform. What does it say? Plexiform lesions. Oh yeah, there it is, <laughs> sorry. Plexiform lesions are irreversible. So once we get to this phase of pulmonary hypertension, it's not reversible. And then we get this sort of really solid thrombus essentially inside that um, blood vessel and we get new vessels forming through it. So you can see that it's very, like there's way more room in here. This is very maladaptive, this response, but it's what the blood vessel tries to do to stop itself from exploding, essentially. That makes sense? Yep. So over time, if we've got really, really severe changes, pulmonary hypertension, and the pressure on the right-hand side exceeds the left-hand side, So once it gets over that sort of 120, what's going to happen? To the flow through the PDA. Good, excellent. So given what would happen to our murmur when it reverses? It goes away. Yeah, good. So there's 
what causes the murmur is the flow of blood from high pressure to low pressure system. So it's that whooshing of a lot of blood moving over a bigger pressure differential. So the bigger the pressure differential, the louder the murmur. So when, as the pressure starts to get to equilibrium, the murmur will go away completely. And then as it shifts and the right side gets more pressure than the left, we're going to have blood flowing right to left, but it's going to be much lower velocity. The chances of there being a difference of 100 millimetres of mercury between the right and the left goes away. So quite often there's not an audible murmur once that um, has developed. I so had an I'm, I'm, sorry, I, I had an idea there was another important clinical sign associated with the reverse PDA. Yep. Um, how am I going to hint you at this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so reverse PDAs, so the blood coming into the aorta is deoxygenated at the level of the PDA. The blood going to the head comes off the subclavian, comes off before the PDA dumps into the aorta. Is this that really weird thing where they have like blue mucous membranes on their face, but then down by like their vulva or their propuse, they're still pink? Other way around. Oh, damn. Yeah. The weird thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wonder if I can draw. This is very advanced zooming, if I can draw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, Alex, can you grab the heart model? Oh, yeah. I'll be back. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks. It, um, it so happens before the uh, because the arterial supply to the head comes off before the shunt enters the uh, exactly uh, yeah the aorta. So the 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 blood in the left side of the heart is oxygenated. It's been through the lungs. So can you show us the aorta? Oh, that's yeah, lovely, excellent. Okay, so if we've got see those. See the three vessels come, like pointing upwards that Alex has got pointing at the camera right now? So they're the vessels that all come up to go to the head. If you've got a PDA, the blood coming from the pulmonary artery, you guys can't see my pointer, can you? <laughs> so can, can you see the pul uh, pulmonary artery? Where is it? I think that's it pointing at us. Oh, the blue one. one. Yeah, because it's not oxygenated yet. Good. So the pulmonary artery, where the PDA will actually be between oh, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. It? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Ooh. exactly. That little ligament. So see how that enters into the aorta after those vessels come off to the head? So as the left side of the heart pumps oxygenated blood out, the head gets oxygenated blood, mm -hmm. and then the PDA dumps all the deoxygenated blood into the aorta which is then means that the delivery of the blood to the caudal half of the body is deoxygenated and blue. So if you check vulval mucous membranes compared with, or propitial mucous membranes compared with um, oral mucous membranes, you'll see differential cyanosis is the very kind of distinctive clinical sign. I've only ever seen it once. I wouldn't look for it in every patient. <laughs> yeah. um, so good, excellent clinical uh, exam finding. Um, what about, we're still talking about this dog being older and having some kind of adaptive heart changes on its echo. Um, if you've got a left to right, so we're still left to right shunting PDA now. Um, if you've got blood going from the left to the right, and not going to the kidneys, what's going to happen? More hypertension? Yeah. The Why? Kidneys, the kidneys think that there's not sufficient blood flow. And so mm -hmm. RAS makes it go, you need to increase your cardiac output. Excellent. So there'll be hypertension and there will be, what else will RAS cause? Sodium retention. Yeah. Which will cause? 
Fluid Fluid. 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 Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when we know, so regardless of what heart disease there is, what happens to the left atrium when we've got volume overload? Stretches. Mm, absolutely. And the left atrium seeing all its blood twice. So it's pumping the blood out, half of it's going back to the right side and it's coming back to the left atrium. So it's having to work twice as hard to get the same amount of blood out to the rest of the body. So we're going to see left atrial enlargement. And when you say, I, I'm going to correct you, Alex, because stretches is accurate in the appearance, but it's actually grows. So it's not, it's not just going, mm, it happens over time to accommodate the increased fluid. So does it create new cells? Yep. Oh, cool. It grows bigger. Yeah. And then what about the left ventricle? What happens when there's volume overload? The eccentric hypertrophy to start with. Excellent. Very good. So eccentric hypertrophy as opposed to concentric hypertrophy. Um, so that means that the internal diameter of the left ventricle gets bigger. Um, now that's adaptive. So that the, big, the more the ventricle stretches to a point, the more force it contracts with. So that's a really good adaptation short term, but over time the myocardium will fatigue and will end up with myocardial failure. It's not uncommon with adult dogs with PDAs to present in left sided congestive heart failure. And the biggest hearts I've ever seen have been PDA, PDA dogs. Um, and in fact, not, even, not just adults, like sort of early adults, like nine to 12 months kind of thing, if they've got a big PDA. Excellent. So that's sort of PDA. What's the treatment of a left to right shunting PDA? Anna, can I ask a question? Oh yeah, of course. The, the continuous murmur from mm -hmm. the very beginning, is that almost pathognomonic for it being a PDA, that it's systolic and diastolic? It's a really good question. And I'm going to keep the answer up my sleeve because I want to do another case next. Okay. <laughs> so not, not quite. It continue, truly continuous murmur, yes, but I find it very hard to differentiate that from a systolic and diastolic murmur. Okay. Um, what were we talking about? Treatment. Oh, what are, how are we going to treat it? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Like ligation. Ligation of the shunt slowly. Good. Yeah. They actually do it pretty fast. They're wild. All oh, right. <laughs> and they just clamp it. Oh. Yeah, pretty much. Like they put a tie around it and they check the pressure and then they tie it. Oh. Um, Marie puts those little bung things in, doesn't she? As well. Exactly. Yeah. So in dogs over, God, I think it's like 2.5 kilos now, they've like advanced the um, occluders so much, but they literally put a femoral artery catheter in and they feed it up into the aorta and then down into the PDA and then they go and put a plug in it. And the put plug. a what in it? Sorry, Anna? put a put a plug in it. Oh, plug, right. Yeah. Um, so cool. there's these little occluders, and they've got from um, prothrombotic stuff kind of embedded in them. So they're kind of a mesh thing. So the blood initially moves through them, but then very rapidly they thrombose and block the flow of blood through the PDA. What's the risk of it? The like it dislodging and then becoming a giant thrombus? Um, pretty, once it's seated, very minimal. Cool. So there's, there's one subset of patients, which are really rare, who don't, who aren't good candidates for um, these occluders. So the blood coming from the aorta, so aorta's at the top and the pulmonary artery is down the bottom. So the duct, is this shape it's conal so they put the plug in the narrow part down the bottom so all the force is just pushing it to hold it in place essentially and there's actually a like one like wide bit there and then another wide bit there and then the narrow part sits in the lumen of the duct 
So they're pretty hard to dislodge once they're seated. If you release it in the wrong spot, so if you release it once, it, like if you've got your catheter a bit too far forward, it will go off into the lungs. Um, we've had that happen. Well, I've, that's happened in Sydney um, in the last five years, and they just put another one in and left it there. And the dog did fine? Yeah, totally fine. Um, yeah, so sometimes they can retrieve it depending on where it goes, but other times they just leave them. Um, so that's kind of optimal treatment for PDA. Rita does those probably two every two weeks or something like that at our clinic. Um, so if anyone's interested, and I think Dick does them too, doesn't he? Yeah, yes, he does. Yeah. Um, so that's probably ideal. It's so much less invasive, particularly in smaller animals where the surgery is so invasive um, and quite dangerous, um, much, much lower morbidity and mortality. Uh, have you seen any complications with that procedure, Max? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Um, so the subset of patients that aren't candidates for it are those patients where their duct doesn't taper. It's just a like straight line duct. And then there's, the, there's nothing really to wedge them in. Um, so those ones are at high risk of going up into pulmonary, pulmonary circulation. The other thing with those dogs, is, which is really, really rare, they're really huge ducts. So usually the pressure on the right and left side is just at equilibrium when they're young and they're the, they're the dogs that get the reverse PDAs because there's just this huge amount of blood flowing and no restriction to its flow. Um, so they're usually in big trouble um, if they've made it to adulthood at all. What dogs are prone to PDAs? Well, look, you mentioned a Sheltie just then. Mm, Shelties, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've seen it in a Border Collie. Yeah. Um, um, Labradors? German Shepherds, uh, Corgis, Bichons, Chihuahuas, Yorkies. It's the most common congenital um, abnormality, I think. Yeah, it is most common in dogs. Um, so we do see it a fair bit in lots of different dogs. Um, okay, so the next most common congenital abnormality is subaortic stenosis. Um, technically according to the book, but there's been such a huge shift in breed predisposition that actually pulmonic stenosis, I think clinically for us is something we see more commonly now than subaortic stenosis. So it's just the breeds that are more prone to it. Um, which breeds are prone to subaortic stenosis? I think a boxer is one of them. Good, boxer, yeah. I yep. What I just it? had a cocker spaniel puppy. Oh yeah? I don't, I don't know. If the know. Oh, yeah, they are. Listed. They are listed on the breed um, list. The, the other caveat I was going to make is it's not always accurate to use the breed predispositions from one country and transmit it, translate it to that, another one. That's so true because these are genetic diseases, um, or most of them anyway, um, and the, gen the genetics in each country aren't comparable really. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing... Frenchies with pulmonic stenosis. All of them have pulmonic stenosis. Um, and bull terriers are a classic subaortic stenosis that get really severe. Sorry, bull terriers get aortic stenosis rather than subaortic stenosis. Um, and then the subaortic stenosis is usually boxes, like you say, um, gum retrievers quite commonly. Um, but it's not, not often not severe. And Newfoundlands, most of the studies have been done in Newfoundlands, which we just don't see really. Um, okay, so let's do another case. You're presented with a one-year-old gum retriever who um, has a loud grade three out of six left-sided basilar systolic murmur. 
which is audible in the left axilla and at the thoracic inlet. What's your next diagnostic test going to be? The answer always echo. The is... answer is always echo. <laughs> <laughs> we also... I feel like it was a trick question or something. <laughs> yeah. you wouldn't, if you're in exam, you're going to say radiographs as well, but you're always yeah. going to say echo. <laughs> but to any young dog, remember. Um, when you ask the owner, they say, oh, yeah, sometimes he gets a bit wobbly when he exerts himself. Um, what cause, what, what's your leading differential? Aortic stenosis. Good. Subaortic stenosis, yeah. Aortic stenosis. Yeah. Um, okay, what are you going to see on echo? Um, like increased... Probably increased velocities at the aortic valve. Good, excellent. Anything else? Eccentric hypertrophy, is it? Concentric, excellent. Concentric. Yeah. Good. So that's you... a pressure overload. Exactly, yeah. So that ventricle has to work harder to pump the same amount of blood out the narrower opening. Any muscle working harder is going to grow. I've never understood the difference between eccentric and concentric. Um, that is, I wish I had a diagram for you. Um, is in what triggers it, or uh, well, yeah, I guess what triggers it, and also what it looks like on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the main value, yes, good, Alex. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so obviously this is a normal heart. If you look at that left, the left ventricle there, you can see that the wall, like the internal diameter of the left ventricle is just a little bit bigger than the walls of the left ventricle. If you've got volume overload, what's going to happen to that internal diameter? measurement wise get smaller if there's volume overload oh, oh sorry internal diameter like oh yeah okay it would get bigger yeah. exactly so any disease that causes volume overload fluid retention and volume overload will result result in the heart growing bigger so that's concentric hypertrophy any res any disease that doesn't result in volume overload but requires the heart to work harder, which pretty much is the stenosis, and that's or pulmonary hypertension or systemic hypertension, will result in just the muscle getting thicker without the internal diameter getting bigger. Thanks, okay. Alex. So the eccentricity is the thicker muscle without the uh, enlarged internal diameter. The eccentric is increased volume on the inside, and the heart's getting bigger, like growing outwards. Concentric is the heart just gets thicker all, all up, which actually means that the internal diameter is smaller. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, and that's the uh, pressure overload. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's, that's much easier to explain with a diagram. Sorry about my... Yeah. <laughs> I think she's not very helpful. <laughs> um, okay, so this doggo, we see concentric hypertrophy, so left ventricle. We see increased velocities over the aortic valve. What, um, what are we looking at? Uh, increased velocity, what does that actually mean? It just means that the... Blood's moving through a, a narrower lumen, so it um, it's like getting all, all this blood and kind of pushing it through a narrow spot. So it has to go to kind of get through. It has to move quicker. Yeah, so it's probably a better yeah. way of that. But that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so we call it the pressure gradient. Is how much pressure the left ventricle has to generate to get the blood across that valve. So the difference in pressure between the aorta 
and the left ventricle. Um, so this dog's got clinical signs. So it's having some exercise intolerance. So we only really see that with the high grade um, uh, aortic stenosis, aortic or subaortic stenosis. What are you going to treat this dog with? Can you do, I actually don't know, but can you do balloon valvuloplasty in these guys as well? Or is that only like um, pulmonary? Um, they do do aortic in, not in dogs. So they've tried it extensively thinking it would work, but it doesn't. Um, sorry? Atenolol. Good, exactly right. How come? I'm cheating because I just had this happen and Rita helped me. Oh, good. <laughs> you can explain cheating, it. Cheating, that's learning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I was like, this is great. A great case for me to learn. I actually wrote her yeah. back to ask me more explanation about why atenolol. Yeah. And she said more for cardiac relaxation mm -hmm. and um, antiarrhythmic effect going forward. Mm -hmm. That eventually my puppy would probably die of a sudden arrhythmia yeah. um, before it ever went into congestive heart failure or died of congestive heart failure. Excellent. So th that muscle is so efficient. It will continue to get that blood out through that tiny opening. It won't, won't go into congestive failure. The kidneys will get plenty of blood. We'll never develop volume overload. Why would this dog develop an arrhythmia? From... I think my understanding is from left ventricular enlargement. Exactly. Yeah. So when we've got, we sort of know this from cats more than dogs because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is so much more common in cats. But what happens when a muscle gets too big for its blood supply? Necrosis. Yeah, exactly. So little spots of the myocardium lose their blood supply when it gets too thick. And when you get necrosis, what's then after those cells die, what are they going to be replaced with? Like fib fibrotic material. Excellent. What do you know about the effect of little spots of fibrosis in conduction in, of the... Bad. Um, bad, exactly. Bad. Very disruptive. Yeah. So they can either stop the flow of the um, action potential or they can be an ectopic focus of action potentials. Mm -hmm they can trigger their own. So we get ventricular fibrillation as a result of little spots of necrosis or uh, foci of fibrosis um, or um, ventricular tachycardia. So it can just become its own pacemaker and just perpetuate a, um, a yeah, ventricular tachycardia, which is too fast for the heart to fill properly. So atenolol is a treatment of choice, both clinically, so this dog overdoing it at the park, needing more outflow and the heart just can't keep up with the outflow. It's only on exertion that the heart, when the heart's really under a lot of pressure and can't keep up with outflow. So if you keep this dog's heart rate down, it's just not going to be able to exercise to the point of needing that much blood flow. So it's going to get tired before it collapses. Yeah. Um, and then also, like you say, long-term prevents remodeling or minimizes remodeling and decreases the incidence of ventricular tachycardia. But yes, sudden death is usually the outcome of very severe aortic stenosis. Uh, I found it really interesting why they don't go into failure. It's like I always think eventually that's not going to pump enough, be able to pump enough blood and the blood's going to back up, but that's actually not how it happens. It's fluid retention rather than blood backing up, if that makes sense. All right. What about a six-month-old cat who comes in for desexing and has a very loud sternal murmur to grade five out of six or most audible over the sternum um but is otherwise clinically very well 
What's the test you're gonna do? Uh, echo. <laughs> Good, excellent. Um, sorry, I'm gonna pause this case and go back, Sam. What did the murmur sound like for your subaortic stenosis dog? So it, I was trying, I knew that the lady would go to Rita. So I was trying really mm -hmm. hard to listen very carefully so that I could try to guess it before she gave me the answer. But it turned out that the puppy had severe subaortic stenosis and a BSD. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. Um, so it had a grade five murmur with a thrill. Yeah. And it was 10 weeks old. Oh my gosh. And the murmur was like, sternal left and mm -hmm. very basilar mm -hmm. um, but I could still hear it on the right yeah. and um, it definitely wasn't like a machinery murmur but I couldn't quite decide that there was no diastolic part to it yeah um, definitely systolic but I wasn't sure if there was a diastolic component and then mm -hmm. I probably didn't listen up higher at the inlet oh uh, right okay um so I think that's a really important note that a continuous murmur is not always a PDA because aortic stenosis, they quite often have valvular dysplasia or abnormal valves from the trauma of the blood flowing so fast past them. So they've quite often got an aortic regurge as well. So you hear quite a loud systolic component and then a softer diastolic component during the aortic regurgitation. So we call that a to and fro murmur. It, it's not as continuous. It's more shh, 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 as opposed to the PDA murmur, which is more shh, 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 So there's just that little distinction there, but it can be so hard, particularly at the heart rates we're listening at, to make that distinction. Okay, cat, six-month-old cat with a loud, very loud murmur. Um, very well capped, presents for desexing. We're going to do an echo and we're going to find a VSD. I'm going to let my dog in, sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, so, what are we going to be interested in in this VSD on that? Which what echo changes are going to tell us how significant this is? Um, you, you might see a hypertrophy at the right side of the heart. We should move to the left. So right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what about volume on the right side of the heart? So it should be volume overloaded. Interesting. It should be volume overloaded, but often it's not. Yeah. It's um, the VSDs are often the most common location we see them is a high membranous VSD, which is right up. The, so if you've got kind of got the um, like interventricular septum, the muscle between the ventricles, there's the very muscular component and then this like just membranous part right at the top. So that goes from between the left ventricle, but it actually goes into the right ventricular outflow tract. So not into the ventricle, in, not into the right ventricle. And because that blood is flowing left to right during systole, it actually goes straight out into the pulmonary artery. So it never actually hits the right ventricle in most cases. So we often don't see volume overload, but we will see pressure overload on the right side. Um, what, what's, when you've got a diagnosis of a VSD and you've got a very loud murmur, can you draw any conclusions about um, how significant that is? It is better. It's better, exactly. The cats do everything backwards. So do dogs. But <laughs> why is a louder murmur better when we're talking about a VSD? Uh, the hole is smaller. Yes, exactly. So 
So we've got more turbulence, more resistance to flow from the left to the right, which makes a louder noise. But in theory, smaller hole, less blood flowing, less impact on the heart. So what about if you had a very low grade murmur and it was diagnosed as a VSD? What sort of prognos prognosis would you give your client? Pretty bad, I think. Pretty bad, yeah. So the bigger the hole, the more equilibrium will get between sides of the heart and then the more impact that will have on blood flow. Anna? Yeah. What would make a hole big or small? Like I know it would depend on a cat versus a Great Dane, but in oh. millimeters or so, or or in percentage of the um, septum, what is mm. considered small? Like my, my cocker puppy had a four millimeter BSD, but I didn't know if that's big or small for that size of dog. Yeah, and it's hard because that dog has also a PDA, uh, sorry, uh, subaortognosis sub murmur, murmur, exactly. So it's going to be high grade. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the marker is the width of the hole should be less than 40% of the aortic um, annulus. So your aortic measurement, when you do your LAAO measurement, that like aorta and cross section where you get the three valves all kind of lined up, the diameter across there. If your hole's less than 40% of that diameter, then it's not, it's unlikely to be significant. Okay. That's relies on you being able to accurately measure the width of the hole, which I have to say is very, very difficult. It's often really, I don't know, it's really tricky. I don't know, I can't even explain why, but I, everybody I've spoken to who does echoes is like, oh yeah, you can't measure them accurately. What do you think, Max? Um, I actually don't know. You do, do you do a lot of echoes? Yeah, I've seen a lot of echo, but not, not seeing a lot with congenital problem. Yeah. yeah. I think most people just go, oh, cardiologist, <laughs> when they see congenital. Um, uh, okay, is there any other conditions? We've probably got time for one more that you wanted to cover. I was just thinking about the puppy that had the subaortic stenosis in a, mm -hmm. a, a VDS. So does it make the left ventricular uh, concentric hypertrophy less a problem because it's actually shifting the pressure to the right side? That is exactly the question I asked Rita because apparently that's a really common combination of uh, abnormalities at a um, subaortic stenosis with a VSD. So the way I kind of pictured it is that the left ventricle is like a pop with, it's generating so much pressure and heaps of that blood's going through the VSD once it gets to a certain pressure. So it's kind of like having a pop-off valve and it decreases the concentric hypertrophy, but it also decreases the cardiac output. And it also results in recirculation and overcirculation of the pulmonary vasculature and the left side of the heart. So you end up getting volume overload where normally with subaortic stenosis, you wouldn't get that. And that results in the, all those detrimental RAS activation and more remodeling because of the RAS and the hypertension, and it's quite detrimental apparently. But yeah, I really like your thinking and I like that you got right down into the like, the physiology of the muscle because technically that's, it is releasing, it will decrease the concentric hypertrophy, but then all of the other detrimental kind of mechanisms make it not beneficial. So it's, it's gonna be worse. Sorry. Sorry, it's man. definitely worse, yeah. I understood that congenital um, defects in cats were often multiple. Is often. that so? Yeah, absolutely. Cats and dogs, actually. 
Um, it's really common to get aortic stenosis with VSD, pulmonic stenosis with VSD, valvular dysplasias with um, alongside their stenosis, particularly pulmonic. Let's talk about Frenchies with pulmonic stenosis um, because we're seeing so many of them. Where will we hear the murmur? Left heart base. Good. Is it going to be hard? <coughs> Is it going to be easy to say that's pulmonic or aortic? Uh, they can be quite close together, but mm. it's a tiny bit more cranial and ventral ejection. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I can't, I can't tell at all. I'm yeah. Just like, mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it helps to use the tiny little stethoscopes, but also Frenchie's chest shapes are so weird. Like you can't even put the stethoscope on the right spot really oftentimes. Um, so when you do, what are the clinical signs of pulmonic stenosis? Cyanosis, just guessing. Yeah, I was gonna say that an exercise intolerance maybe. Exercise intolerance. Um, they they quite often have exercise induced collapse, similar to the aortic stenosis. Um, but it's actually because and it's actually because the pressure generated on the right hand side will exceed the heart's kind of got this like. Um, shut off mechanism that will cause a bradyarrhythmia when the ventricle gets to too high a pressure on the right hand side so they often develop a bradyarrhythmia when they're when they really need increased cardiac output so that's what they the sort of clinical signs exercise intolerance um but it's a different mechanism it's not decreased blood flow to the muscles. I uh, also will be obviously because what comes out of the right side of the heart goes to the left side of the heart. And if you're not getting enough out of the right side, then the left side's gonna be um, not performing very well. How do we treat pulmonic stenosis? The balloon dilation. Yeah, absolutely. Are you guys doing them, Max? I haven't seen one yet. Mm. Um, it's really, uh, I haven't seen one either, but Rita does them all the time. Again, um, particularly with the breeds that we're seeing. So what would happen? Why is balloon dilation possible on the right-hand side of the pulmonic valve, but not the left-hand side of the aortic valve? It's not very silly. Oh, you go, Josh. I know. Yeah, I'm just going. Was going to talk about that. Yeah, I was going to guess too. <laughs> um, my theory, and it could be very wrong, but you've got pressure coming out of the aorta. No, don't mm -hmm. worry. Actually, I know it's wrong because that's what we do at PDA. So don't worry, Josh. You do your theory. I think mine was the same. I was just going to say that maybe occluding the aorta is not such a great idea for a period of time. But... It does seem high risk. Yeah um so yes much more time dependent than pulmonic ballooning um but still pulmonic ballooning is very scary like you're just completely completely blocking that right ventricular outflow would you also get like um because the body's adjusted to that decreased pressure coming out mm -hmm. of the, the um left side of the heart if they get a sudden increase in blood pressure that could be dangerous as well a sudden shift in pressure. I don't know. It's another guess, really. After the ballooning. After the ballooning, so yeah. heart's pumping, trying so hard to pump through, mm -hmm. and the body, I'm sure, is trying to compensate by increasing blood pressure. That maybe you might just get a spike of blood pressure that could cause like target organ organ damage, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think you're on the right track. So ballooning damages the valve. If it wasn't damaged already, ballooning will damage it. So after the ballooning, you're going to get really significant regurgitation through that valve, which is not that significant on the right-hand side because it's operating under such low pressures. But on the left-hand side, you can get really significant regurgitation through the aortic valve after the fact, particularly 
under changes in blood pressure situations. Um, it's just also less scary to block the right side of the heart than the left. All right. <clears throat> That's interesting. Anna, I, I saw a Frenchie in Adelaide at nine years old <clears throat> in right-sided heart failure, mm. which at the time we put down to uh, uh, pu uh, corporal Manali. Oh. Now I'm wondering if that could have been congenital because I remember I mentioned it to you at the time and you, you hadn't mm. thought, you know, you hadn't seen that happen, like the, yeah. um, the corporal Manali. Um, in, Why did it have corporal Manali? Uh, because it had been struggling for all its life to, oh, to breathe. Yeah. Um, and the yeah. lungs were under uh, sustained negative pressure every time that dog mm. tried to breathe in. That yeah. was my theory. I'm not sure that mm. we actually confirmed that. Um, yeah. I can't remember now how we, we got the diagnosis, but um, yeah, maybe it was congenital. It could easily have been, and particularly tricuspid dysplasia is quite often undetected because the murmurs are low grade because they're under low pressure and they're on the right hand side of the chest, and you've got to listen quite thoroughly. There's a lot of a lot of people, you know, during your vaccination and stuff that don't listen in all four areas. Um, so that can go missed for quite a long time. That's probably the leading cause of the right side of congestive heart failure in young dogs. Um, Frenchies aren't renowned for valvular dysplasia, I don't think. Although who's got data, like you say, with local populations. Um, but yeah, it would be atypical for a pulmonic stenosis to cause failure. It should just cause pressure overload and then right ventri ventricular thickening. The other thing too is to measure pressure across the valve, isn't it? And less yep. than 50 millimetres of mercury differential is not serious. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, I just go by velocities, but 1.7 is the cutoff, 1.7 metres per second. And then above four is severe most dogs are under 1.7. So it's only with very severe pressure differentials that we get clinical signs. All right, we better wrap up guys. Um, we'll, I hope you guys all got the email. We're having a little break. Ron, thank you for your response. Having a little break over Christmas, Mariano and I. So the last radiology rounds will actually be next week. And the last medicine rounds will be in a fortnight where we will be covering. Um, I might try and get Brooke from cardiology involved and do an ECG one. And we can just run through a whole heap of ECGs if everybody's happy to do that. That's great. Yes. Good. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. And I'll leave you guys to read about Heartworm because it's too boring. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, Anna, it's not. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. We never see it, Jeff. It's just not a problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it's all right for you young fellas, but, yeah, we... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, I've, in, in 2009, I picked up six in Riverston. Um, wow. Uh, one of them was referred for a, a weird cardiac disease. Um, the others were... Um, just, oh, is he on heartworm prevention? Oh, he isn't. Well, shall we test him then? Um, and uh, and uh, the other five, four of the other five were asymptomatic. Wow. Um, one of them was just starting to show signs. Did you pull we the worms out? I went about. Sorry, did I? Pull the worms out? No. You I'm should Google those videos. No, you should Google the what? videos. That's one of my... um. One of my nurses showed us a video of the set from the Central Coast a couple of weeks ago of microfilaria under the microscope. Oh my gosh! Like just so that's it's actually like still around now. It is. Like it's amazing. You, you have to distinguish them from dipetalanina, and and I've oh. just forgotten the distinguishing features now. But I think the microfilaria are fatter, and there's something to do with the tail as well. What's dipetalanina? Uh, it's another, uh, again, I'm not quite sure, but it's, uh, um, 
I've forgotten. Okay, <laughs> it's so nice. long since I used to do that. But there was a time uh, when uh, thirty percent of dogs not on prevention in Sydney would have heartworm, mm. and they used wow. to just pick it up with a, a spot of blood on a slide, and they'd see the the wrigglers. Yeah. Wow. 50% of Brisbane dogs and 100% of Darwin dogs. Wow. But I also saw it in Canberra. Um, dog, when, when Cyclone Tracy hit Darwin and um, uh, the uh, military dogs or military owned dogs came mm. to Canberra, uh, they then, we had one case that where the Infected dog actually was sleeping with another dog, and the other dog must have got it um, yeah. by a mosquito, of course. But yeah, um, but we saw it around the Pialigo Marshes and also around the Woden Golf Course. Wow! But not around the lakes. No. Um, it's a it is a really interesting disease, and it is a good kind of study of what happens when you block certain parts of the heart and things and radiographic changes. Um, but it's just seen so infrequently that I can't get excited it's about so it. so strange. In the eight, recent AVJ, there was an article, uh, a, a case where they, from Sydney Uni, they assumed it was a, a luggage-borne mosquito from Queensland because they assumed that the heartworm disease is so rare in Sydney that it couldn't possibly have been locally applied, which seems, very, really, seems very odd to me. Like, mm. it can't be that rare. The dog never left Western, like, inner west. Yeah, uh, I am um, not that rare, but I mean, I've never ever seen one in 20 years, but yeah, <laughs> it's on the central coast, like it's got to be the odd one in Sydney. But also, the dogs that we're seeing are the dogs that are either testing or having preventatives, yeah. So, I guess it's true, yeah. This bit. dog is oh, having preventatives, yeah. yeah. This, um, when in uni, one of our surgical pracs, we were doing something and we dissected the heart and there was heartworm in there and that was a sydney like a yuguna oh yeah like yeah um euthanized dog but interestingly i think the biomass of the worm is quite low now mm. um when i was in wagga i expect we had the floods in 2010 i came home one night and in, in my flat there were a dozen mosquitoes lined up on the sea on the wall yeah uh, they didn't last long but um <laughs> And I thought, right, six months' time, we're going to see heartworm, but we didn't. And yeah. and they hadn't seen heartworm for 10 years. And how long was the drought? 10 years. But oh, interesting. Given that it was yeah. first described in Australia in Leeton by David Rees, mm. that was during my studentship, so that would be over half a century ago. Wow. Um, I thought we'd have to see it in Wagga after that, but no, we didn't. Mm. Um, yeah, so the, uh, and in North America, like at Tufts where I did my residency, um, they used to test for it. And we used to say in Canberra it was too cold for heartworm because it's got to be, the minimum temperature has to be about 15 degrees centigrade, which often yes. it isn't in Canberra. Yes. Uh, but, uh, and in Massachusetts, it's so cold in winter that the ponds freeze over. Uh, and yet they used to get heartworm. But then, see, they, they had a lot of surface water and a very humid summer. And mm. consequently, a lot of mosquitoes. A lot of mozzies, yeah. Mm. It was California didn't get it much at all because it was hot and dry. All right. Well, everybody have a good day. Thank you. Thank have you. A good day. We will. Thank you, everyone.